for doing what, 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 we, what we do, amen, as a family. Praise God. Um, that being said, let's, let's get into the word. Amen. Before we get into tonight's word, we're going to be coming out of the book of James. We're still on chapter 4. Uh, we're going to pick up at verse 7, um, which is where we left off two Tuesdays ago. Amen. And um, I'm excited about this word today. But before we get into that word, I want to throw out a little testimony. Um, so I'm at work today. And, you know, I met a few months ago, I met a Muslim at work. And um, it's funny, he wanted to talk to somebody, and they, they've they known him to be a, a Muslim, so I was the only one available at the time when he needed to speak to somebody, so they forewarned him, and they said, uh, you know, we're going to send you to Jason, but just so you know, Jason's a pastor of a Christian church, and uh, they put us together, amen? So when... He comes and he sits down with me. His first words were, hey, listen, um, so I want to talk to you, right? But I just need you to know that I'm a Muslim. And um, I was like, okay. And he was like, so you don't got to really uh, talk to me or teach me anything about Jesus because I'm good. And I was like, praise God. Amen. So we talked a little bit about the, the resources that we could provide for him and you know, I just began telling him a little bit about myself, and one day of talking turned into two, two days of talking, and two days of talking turned into weeks of talking. Now this gentleman, he calls my phone, if not texts my phone, almost every day. And um, today I was at work, and I was on the phone, and I look at the door of my office, and there's a figure standing in there, and it's him. And... Um, He walks in the door with tears in his eyes and he said, I want, I want your God to be my God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. He says, I want your God to be my God and I want to do it right now. Amen. He said, um, what, what, what do we got to do for your God to be my God? And, you know, I'm, I'm on the phone and I, I don't even excuse myself from the phone call and I put the phone down and I just start talking to him. And I said, I'm going to ask you some questions. And um, after I ask you some questions, I'm going to ask you to repeat a prayer after me. And then after that, I'm going to pray for you. And he was like, let's do it. And with tears in his eyes, this man who was a devout Muslim accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 And, um, you know, you don't, you don't got to force Jesus upon anybody. You just love people to life. You just testify about who God is in your life. And uh, it makes people curious. It makes people want to wanna know. You show your fruits. You talk in a manner that represents God. You walk in a manner that represents God. You do your due diligence as a believer. And people will get saved without stepping foot in the church. It's, it's, it's not about these four walls. It's about your testimony outside of these four walls. Who are you when you are not in the house of God? That's, that's what matters. Anybody can come here and play church. Anybody can come here and look like a Christian. Anybody can come here and talk like a Christian or uh, attempt to speak in tongues and oh, total bullshit, tendere, like a Christian. Amen. Anybody can do that. But like I said on Sunday, I can stand in a garage for five years. That doesn't make me a car. Being in a church... Every service doesn't make you a Christian. Mm -hmm. What makes you a Christian is the spiritual disciplines that you apply to your life day in and day out. Amen? Amen. So I challenge you to apply the number one discipline that you need to apply to your life as a believer, and that's love. Learn to love people. Learn to talk to people. Don't walk around all quiet and into your own problems and into your own situations and sir listen we're all going to go through something at some point or another we're all going to go through something but that's not that's not to be advertised to the world that's to be advertised in your prayer closet to the father who can actually do something 
about that situation and circumstance. What we advertise to the world is that God is good. What we advertise to the world is that we appreciate a God that can. What we advertise to the world is that we love you right where you are. If you don't change a thing about you, we love you anyway. That's what we advertise to the world. Praise God. Let's open our Bibles to James chapter 4, starting at verse 7, and we're going to continue on for the rest of the chapter. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Last week, as we were talking about the book of James, as I always like to mention, um, for those who weren't here, um, James is special to me. I, I, I love James. Um, do we have any siblings in the house? I, yeah, I see, I see a set of siblings right here, right? Praise God. Let me ask you a question. Do you know stuff about your sister that nobody else knows? Yes. Praise God. Praise God. Sister, do you know stuff about your sister that nobody else knows? Of course she does. Amen. Of course she does. That's the reality of being siblings. I see two siblings back there. Jairus, Jayliana, God bless you. You guys are siblings. Four years apart. Do you know stuff about each other that nobody else knows? You guys know what each other's bad feet smell like, right? You know that stuff. Praise God. You guys know things about each other because you grew up together. So you can say, this is how my sister is. This is how my brother is. You can testify to that and people will believe you because you indeed grew up with them and have a relationship and rapport that nobody else has. Erica's my sister. She knows things about me that nobody else knows. She lived with me. We grew up together. She's technically my niece because she's my older sister's daughter, but we had her since she was born and we raised her like a sister, so she's become my sister. She's my sister. Amen. Amen. She knows things about her brother. I know things about my sister that nobody else knows. What's your point, Pastor Jason? My point is that Jesus Christ had a brother, and his name was James. James wrote this book. James spent the years that you don't hear about Jesus in the Bible with Jesus. So from baby infancy stage to the age of 30, when Jesus Christ started his ministry, James spent time with Jesus. James knows Jesus. James knows his behaviors. James knows what he did and what he didn't do as a child. So when somebody like that writes a book and he labels Jesus Christ the Christ, the Messiah, it matters. Because if Jesus Christ wasn't who the Bible says he is, James wouldn't feel the conviction that he feels to write the words that he writes in this book. His words matter. His words make a whole lot of sense because he is testifying about a gospel that is based on his brother. For James to believe, it tells me that Jesus is exactly who he says he is. Praise God. Chapter 7, I mean chapter 4 verse 7, we left off, it says, Submit unto God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I'm going to read it from the Amplified Classic Edition. It says, So be subject to God, resist the devil, stand firm against him, and he will flee from you. There's some folks in this church and there's some folks that are going to watch on YouTube that are going through trials and tribulations in their life. And, and they're looking for a way to slow that trial or tribulation down or to get rid of it or to get through it or to overcome it, whatever it may be. Verse number seven, it gives you a quick little formula for lack of a better term. It says, submit unto God or so be subject to God. So we got to stop right there for a minute, even though we touched this last week. We got to stop right there for a minute because it's teaching you something that's very important and very effective for the rest of your Christian walk. Submitting unto God. What does that mean, pastor? What does that look like, pastor? There has to be a life of prayer in your Christian walk. 
there has to be a whole lot of opening the good book and spending time reading. There has to be. That is part of the process of submitting to something. Is doing the things that are required by that something. In this case, Christianity. Submit unto God. Prayer. Fasting. Reading the word. Loving people to life. Fellowshipping. Showing up. Being a part. Relationship. Love. Love. And more love. Submitting unto God. It says if you submit unto God, the next step is to resist the devil. Brother Wong, come in. <clears throat> Offer me something. <laughs> Anything. I'm not interested. Sure. I'm not interested. Got the good goods for you. <laughs> I'm genuinely not interested. This is even better though. This is even better. Even better. <laughs> and it's for free. It's on me. <laughs> now you keep that. I know you. I know you. I know you definitely want it. It's it's it, it's tempting. It really is. It's nice. It's shiny. Hmm. I'm good. Thank you. All right, two for the price of one. <laughs> for the free. <laughs> for the low, low, bro. <laughs> for the low, low, bro. It's for free. It's for you and for me. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Right, I'm so, all set. You're all set? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Right, show me you're all set. You walk away. He offered me. And he offered me. And he offered me, and I resisted. I'm not interested. I thought about it. Hmm. It's a good offer. It's tempting. It's intriguing. Hmm. The things that I can do on that tablet. The things that I can do on that phone. The time that I can waste. On that tablet and phone. The doors that I can open on that tablet and phone. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Submit unto God. Resist the devil. It's as simple as a yes or no. We just demonstrated it. It's as simple as a yes or no. Let your yeses be yes. Let your noes be no. You submit unto God and you resist the devil. And then the Bible says, not Pastor Jason. The Bible says that he will flee. What did he do? He walked away. He said, this guy's not interested. I tried. I tried to make it intriguing for him. I tried to give it to him for free. I tried to give it to him for the low, low. <laughs> he wasn't interested. So what am I going to do? I'm going to take this foolishness elsewhere. Get that in your spirit. Get that in your spirit that if you let your yeses be yes, and if you let your noes be no, the devil is going to walk away from your situation and circumstance. It's as simple as having some integrity on what you believe. Praise God. Amen. Verse number eight. It says, Come close to God and he will come close to you. That's a beautiful thing. Come close to God. Just out of curiosity. Anybody in the house. How do we get close to God? Reading his word. Reading his word. Anybody else? Uh, establishing a personal relationship. How do you establish a personal relationship? Praying. Being Praying. honest. Praying. Being honest. Being honest. I like that. I like that. God knows anyway. God knows anyway. Somebody was recently attempting to hide something from me. And I started scratching my head. I'm not God. I'm not the dictator that determines whether or not you enter into the kingdom of heaven. I'm just little old Pastor Jason, a humble servant doing what I'm told to do by God. You can try to hide something from me all day long, but you're confusing yourself. Why? Because I'm not the one that matters here. Amen. It's God. You can't hide anything from God. Therefore, you should live your life as an open book. It makes life so much easier. It makes life so much easier just to tell people the raw truth. They can receive it if they want it. They can reject it if they want to reject it. But if you're raw 
and you're real, God can work with you. God can't work with fake. Why? Because he can't trust you. If you're lying, if you're hiding, if you're scheming and scamming, he can't trust you. If you're constantly complaining, he can't trust you. Why? Because you're going to turn people off from the gospel of Jesus Christ as opposed to turning people on to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, draw near unto God. Prayer. Being honest. Anybody else? Consistency. Diligent. Day in. Day out. Day in. Day out. On good days and on bad days. I don't feel like being a pastor every day. The phone calls that I get. The text messages that I get. The problems that I have to help pray for and solve. I signed up for this. I don't feel like pastoring every day. I'm confessing to my church. I don't feel like pastoring y'all every day. Why? Because I'm human. Why? Because I have my feelings. Why? Because I have my desires. Why? Because I have my weaknesses that I have to fight. Why? Because I have my temptations. I don't feel like doing it sometimes, but I do it anyway. Why? Because I'm not doing it for me. I'm doing it for God. Amen. And it needs to matter that much. God needs to become that important that no matter how you feel, day in and day out, I'm going to do this thing called Christianity. And my Bible says, if you take that approach, drawing near to God, day in and day out, regardless to how you feel, the Bible says that God will begin to draw near to you. That's right. What happens in a Christian's life when God begins to draw near to that believer? You have no choice but to change. He's so loving. He's so forgiving. He's so merciful. He's so powerful. He's so full of love that it puts you in a position that you just desire to surrender. You desire to do it again tomorrow regardless of how you feel. You desire to lay it all down. You desire it. It genuinely becomes a desire of your heart. I don't care what I have to do. Heaven is the goal and nothing else matters. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Come close to God and he will come close to you. Recognize that you are sinners. Get your soiled hands, your dirty hands clean. Let's stop right there for a minute. Somebody else in a different version, read the first part of verse 8. It says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Stop right there. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. He's talking to all of us. When you wake up in the morning, you wake up a sinner. That very moment, you have a decision to make. Am I going to operate the rest of my day in sin or am I going to live today for the glory of God? Amen. It's, it's a decision you have to make. You have to confront this decision every single day. Am I going to get up and pray? Am I going to get up and read the word? Am I going to get up and brush my teeth and make my bed and organize my house so demonic spirits of dirtiness don't stay all over my house while I go to work? Am I going to prepare the atmosphere and change it from sinful because I woke up a sinner to godly because I serve a mighty God? Am I going to put some praise and worship on? Am I going to listen to some messages to start my day right? Or am I going to complain about having to go to work and all the bills that I have and all the frustrations of life and oh, this wife of mine, oh, this husband of mine. Am I going to complain throughout my entire day or am I going to give God some praise and show him that I am who I say I am, a son of the most high God? Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. But Pastor Jason, why are you so passionate when you talk about Jesus? 
Why do you scream so much? <laughs> Why do you get so emotional, Pastor? It's because he's so good. It's because he's so real. It's because he's so raw. It's because if you draw near to him, he gets involved in the smallest details of your life. He gets involved. <laughs> Listen, you know how many people don't get involved? You know how many boyfriends don't get involved? You know how many parents don't get involved? You know how many teachers don't get involved? You know how many people just ignore you throughout your day? God gets involved in the details of your life. When you submit unto God, resist the devil, and draw near to God. Come on, somebody. I feel like preaching tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Mm. Every now and then, I'll tell you. Come on. It says, come close to God and he will come close to you. Recognize that you are sinners and get your dirty hands clean. Listen, I don't care. I know there's some weed smokers in the house. I don't care. I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to love you. Amen. What I'm going to tell you is this. Amen. Keep smoking weed. I'm not telling you to stop. I want you to keep smoking weed. I want you to smoke weed, and I want you to add prayer, fasting, and reading the word to your weed smoking. There's going to come a day that as you continue to pray, that as you continue to fast, that as you continue to read your word, that that weed is just going to vanish from your life. If, if, listen, if you try to do it in the opposite direction and say, I'm going to quit smoking weed and I'm going to read the Bible, pray and fast, you're going to get tired of praying, reading the Bible and fasting, and you're going to go back to weed. But if you keep smoking weed as you read the word, as you pray, and as you fast, the Holy Spirit is the one that's going to do the work. And when he does the work, it's a complete work. It will not come back. That sounds crazy, Pastor Jason. You are encouraging me to smoke weed. No, I'm encouraging you to come to God just the way you are. I'm encouraging you to come to God, the only one that can change you, just the way you are. Get in his presence. And as you continue to draw near to him, when he draws near to you, he is so holy. He is so glorious. He is so refined and so clean that as he draws near to you, you're going to desire to let go of anything that is not godly. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Can you give me a water, son? There's some right there, brother. Praise God. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Praise God. Come close to God and he will come close to you. Recognize that you are sinners. I love that. Recognize. Don't try to hide it. Don't deny it. Don't push it to the side. Don't push it to the back burner. Don't put up a screensaver for the world to see when in reality you move the mouse and you dirty. Don't do it. Just recognize that you are a sinner. Recognize that you need God. Recognize that your hands need to be washed. Amen. Praise God. It says... Recognize that ye are sinners. Get your soiled hands clean. It says, realize that you have been disloyal. Realize it. Mm. It's a beautiful thing. You know, I'm working with a married couple, right? And, you know, one of the parties in the relationship committed adultery. Right? Mm -hmm. And... The other party in the relationship is broken. The party that committed adultery, now they're sorry. In my opinion, they're sorry because they got caught, not sorry because of the adultery. They're sorry that they got caught. That's how I feel. I'm entitled to my feelings, right? They're sorry that they got caught because if, 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 if that wasn't the case, they wouldn't have been doing it to begin with, right? When you love somebody, love looks like something. Love sounds like something. Love is something. And I don't want anybody settle, settling for anything less than true love. But now as I'm counseling these two, right, one of them is broken. But the broken person has decided to forgive the culprit. I'm going to forgive because I love you and I don't want to lose you. Now here's the thing. 
And I want you to get this into your spirit, right? Because you're going to run into people. If not, you're going to run into the situation yourself when you get married or in relationship, right? Or you're going to run into a couple or a family member that needs some advice or whatever the case may be. And because you're living such a godly life and because you're operating in the fruits of the spirit, it draws people to you to ask questions. The party that has decided to forgive periodically as a human being starts to feel the hurt of the brokenness and brings it up out of their mouth. Let me tell you something. The person that is broken, there is nothing wrong with that. There is a process for healing. Healing takes time. And the culprit in, 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 in the situation, but if you forgave me, why are we talking about this? If you forgave me, why are you bringing it up? If you forgave me, this shouldn't even be brought up anymore. That's a lie from the pit of hell. We are in relationship together. And because we are in relationship together, you need to understand that it's going to take time for this heart to heal that you broke. And every now and then, I'm going to ask myself in my insecurities, why did he do it? Why did he break this heart of mine? Why did he hurt me? Why did she break this heart of mine? Why did she walk out on me and with somebody else? Why did she break the covenant? Why did she break the oneness and make it two-ness? Why? It's okay for the person that's been broken to want some answers. In my opinion, wholeheartedly, the person that did the breaking needs to give answers. And not just one time. In three months, if they want to talk about it again. In six months, if they want to talk about it again. In nine months, if they want to talk about it again. And in 12 months. Why? Because if you're sorry, you recognize that that person has to go now into a cycle of healing. And healing takes time. Amen. Every now and then, I get a cut on something. And as I'm putting on a pair of jeans or something, it scrapes the scab and it starts to bleed again. The healing process starts all over again. Every now and then, I'm moving a piece of furniture or doing something, and I bump into that wound, and that wound opens up again. It just doesn't heal yet. It takes time to heal. I want to talk about it. We need to learn that healing takes time. We need to learn how to be better listeners. We need to learn how to be better communicators. As you draw near to God, God is going to draw near to you and he's going to open your mind to all of these realities. He's going to open your mind to them. I wasn't always a smart man. You know, I'm still not smart. I'm a work in progress. I got my GED. God educates dummies. He educated me a little bit. He educated me a little bit, just, just a tad. Y'all are learning from a dummy. <laughs> What'd that make you? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. But here's the reality. When God begins to draw near to you, something begins to happen in your life. Your thinking begins to change. Your desires begin to change. Your love begins to change. You don't settle for just anything anymore. It's, it's, it's different when God starts getting close to you. It's one thing when you start getting in his presence and you feel the Holy Spirit. When you start getting in his presence and crying and talking about your cares and letting things go. It feels good and it's, it's a great feeling, right? And it's something special when that happens. When you start releasing and, and you start developing a desire to get in his presence. It's great, right? But there's something different that occurs when God begins to draw near to you. A change in the atmosphere occurs. A change in your thinking. A change in your wants and needs begin to occur. And life is not the same. It's easier to repent. It's easier to be honest. It's easier to forgive. It's easier to love. It's easier. Amen. Amen. It says, get your dirty hands clean. Realize that you have been disloyal, wavering individuals with divided interests. We have divided interests, wavering individuals. 
Today we want God. Tomorrow we want Jason. Today we want God. Tomorrow we want Susan. Today we want God. Tomorrow we want everything. Today we want God. Tomorrow we want the world. Today we want God. Tomorrow, hmm, I'm just confused. There's a lot of confused Christians in the world that we live in. There's nothing confusing about Holy Bible. It's pretty straight to the point. It says, and purify your hearts of your spiritual adultery. Hmm. What do you mean spiritual adultery, Pastor? That sounds crazy. Spiritual adultery? Yeah. Yeah, why? Because when you come to Christ, you are supposed to lay down the flesh and become a spirit being. The Bible says, for God is holy. He's holy. Therefore, we must be holy. Holiness is separated from the world for God. So how do you commit spiritual adultery? When you separate from that spiritual holiness and operate in carnality. Oh, but it feels so good. Oh, but I like it. Like it. Okay. Praise God. Adultery. Spiritual adultery. You know what that does? That quiets the voice of God in your life. That quiets the move of the Holy Spirit in your life. That puts the Holy Spirit in an uncomfortable position inside of the temple called you. in this church. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. It says, as you draw near to God, be deeply penitent and grieve. Penitent means sorry. Be deeply sorry and grieve. Well, why, why would you want me to grieve, God? Why? Check it out. It says, even weep over your disloyalty. Let laughter be turned into grief and your mirth to dejection and heartfelt shame for your sins. You're supposed to hurt. You're supposed to hurt for your disloyalty. Let's talk about that married couple again. If the individual that broke the other party does not feel hurt that they broke the other party, is not willing to talk about the situation, is not willing to confess about the situation, is not willing to give details about the situation, are they really sorry? Mm. Come on. Come on. Yeah, I'm talking to you. Not me. <laughs> Point at me. <laughs> you, 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 you listening through social media. Yeah. yeah. If, if, if she want to talk about it, listen. If she want to talk about it again, listen again. Why? Because you should feel sorry that you broke that woman. Amen. Listen, it says, as you draw near to God, be deeply penitent and grieve. Why is the word telling us to be so sorrowful that we're grieving and weeping? You want to know why? Because the Bible says that God never turns away a broken and contrite spirit. When you get in God's presence, broken and contrite, you know what he does? He gives you an ear and he hears you. He pays attention to the details of the words that are coming out of your mouth. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing to know that in the midst of your brokenness, the creator of all, is taking time out of his busy schedule. You know how many people are praying around this entire world? 
who knows in the galaxy. There might be aliens praying. I'm not sure. I can't call it right. I can talk about Earth, though. He takes time out of his busy schedule to listen to you. Let your laughter be turned to grief and your mirth to dejection and heartfelt shame for your sins. It says, humble yourselves, feeling very insignificant in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. He will lift you up and make your lives significant. When you humble yourself in the presence of God and acknowledge that you are nothing and you are nobody without God, you're humbling yourself. The Bible says that God begins to pay attention to you and says, I can trust you. And because I can trust you, I'm going to lift you up and start using you. I'm going to lift you up and make an example out of you. I'm going to lift you up and take all the brokenness of your past. Take all the shame of your past. Take all the hurt of your past. And I'm going to put you in a crowd of people just like you used to be. And you're going to be able to speak into their lives. You're going to be able to comfort their hurting hearts. You're going to be able to counsel them. Why? Because you have gone through a process now of acknowledging who you are not and acknowledging who God God is. And because you know who God is, I want you to share who God is. Come on, somebody. Humble yourself before an almighty God and he will exalt you. You want to be somebody? Put your head to the floor every day. Your head. Put your head to the floor every day and bow down to the master. Bow down to God and let him know. I know I am nothing without you. If you don't feel like it, I don't wake up tomorrow. Reality. But you have to acknowledge who God is. You have to know beyond a shadow of a doubt who God is and who you are not. You are not the Lord of your life. You have no control of your life. None. For real. We think we're somebody a lot of times. We think we're big and bad. We think we're decision makers. And then God says, okay. Angels, back up for a little bit. Let's let Mr. Fly Guy be fly. Mr. Fly Guy develops a disease, a sickness, HIV, cancer. Something that humbles him. Because in the same manner that if you humble yourself, God will exalt you. There's a flip side to that. If you exalt yourself, God will humble you. And the way he humbles you is not by hurting you. It's simply by taking a step back and saying, do you? Do you? I'm going to respect your free will. Let's see if you really want God results or you results. Let's test that theory. Let's test that gangster. Let's test that, that tough guy. Let's test that stankness. I don't need nobody. Mm -hmm. Women have a movement going on. Act like a lady would think like a man. I don't need nobody. Yeah, yeah. Women have become the new men. I used to have this theory. I used to say, you know what? All men are dogs. A dog, you observe them, and they go outside, and they squat in front of anybody. They don't care who's looking, and they poop, and everybody sees it. Women, they're cats. They also poop, but they jump in a litter box, and they cover it up. That used to be my theory. But now, women have become dogs, female dogs. There's a word for that. We ain't going to get into that. Not in the house of God, right? But women have become dogs. Women are doing just like men. Because they're empowered by the movement. Listen. God created order. God created order in his house. God created order in what he chose to be Christianity. Holy Bible. Holy Bible. If we turn it into an acronym 
He only left you basic instructions before leaving earth. He only left you basic instructions before leaving earth. They're very basic. The do's and don'ts of Christianity. Don't take my word for it. Read the book. Read the book. I promise you it will change your life. This book is alive. How do I know? That's my testimony. Yeah. It took me prison. I wanted to do me. I ended up in prison. The book was the only thing in the room for 75 days in solitary confinement. And I read the book. And I realized, I need God. I need God. The book changed my life. Listen. It says, as you draw near to God, verse 9, as you draw near to God, be deeply penitent and grieve and weep over your disloyalty. Let your laughter be turned into grief and your mirth to dejection and heartfelt shame for your sins. It says, humble yourselves, verse 10, feeling very insignificant in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. He will lift you up and make your lives significant. Let God make somebody out of you. 11, my brethren, do not speak evil or accuse one another. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Shut your mouth in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. I need that all. Can I get an amen? Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Shut your mouth in the name of Jesus is the ghetto version of this verse. Listen, sometimes the holiest thing I can say to somebody is in the name of Jesus, shut your mouth. Hallelujah. Ain't that right, brother? Hallelujah. <laughs> My brethren, do not speak evil about or accuse one another. Don't do it. Don't do it. Like, love. Love covers a multitude of sins. Love your brother. Love your neighbor. Stop talking about your brothers and sisters in Christ. He that maligns a brother or judges his brother is maligning and criticizing the law and judging the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a practicer of the law, but a censor and judge of it. You become a judge when you start accusing your brethren. A judge. A judge has power and authority given by God. Are we judges? Listen, it's, 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 it's not my job to judge. I can't, I can't say who is and who isn't going to heaven or hell in this place. That's God's job. He's the judge. Jesus is the lawyer. We need a lawyer to <clears throat> fight our case so that we can get into heaven and avoid hell. Learn that Jesus is the one that speaks, not you. When you go to a court as a person who has committed a crime, you don't talk to the judge. Your lawyer does. Same result in Christianity. You come to your prayer closet in the name of Jesus. That's the only reason why God hears that prayer. Because your attorney, your attorney done covered you with his blood that he shed on Calvary's cross. So now God can see you. God can hear you. But it's through Jesus. It's through that lawyer. We should not be judging each other. We should not be talking about each other. If we're going to say anything, let's love, let's encourage, let's uplift. Let's speak about the good qualities that our brothers and sisters have. Let's motivate them. If somebody comes to you to speak evil of another brother or sister, pump the brakes on it. Respectfully, listen, that's not how we get down at CCC. Amen. The name of the church is Christ-like. We're going to operate in that manner. Christ-like. What would Jesus do? Practice that. Every day. Every day. Before you make decisions, every day. Before you start complaining, every day. Before you do anything, every day. Ask yourself that question. With God, 
Would God be okay with the words that are about to come out of my mouth? Is God okay with the thoughts that are in my head? Is God okay with the actions that I'm about to engage in? Listen. Twelve. One only is the lawgiver and judge. One. <laughs> One. And it's not you. It's not you. It's not me. I'm the pastor of the church and I got no authority. None. None. It's him. It's always been him. Now he gives grace and he gives positions and he gives titles and he gives authority to a certain extent. Amen? But it's always about God. If I ever sit here and talk about me, 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 run to another church. Because it's not about me. It's about Jesus. It says, who is able to save and destroy. There is only one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and destroy. The one who has absolute power of life and death. He's not talking about you. Thank you, Lord. God. Thank you, Jesus. It says, but you, who are you that you presume to pass judgment on your neighbor? That's a question. Who are you? Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? I'm talking about your sister. I'm talking about my sister. Praise God. Talking about anybody. Amen. Who do you think you are? Like at the end of the day, if we're going to be Christians, let's be Christians. Because because God did not strong arm you and say serve me. That's not how He gets down. He's a gentleman. He didn't force you to come into Christianity. So if you're going to come into Christianity, open the book and learn what it entails. You don't have to wait for Tuesdays. You don't have to wait for Sundays. You can do this seven days a week at your house. You can learn what it entails. If you don't understand, 508-579-0422. How you going? My name is Pastor Jason Oquendo. I'm willing to help. It says, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go in such and such a city and spend a year there and carry on our business and make money. 14, it says, yet you do not know the least thing about what may happen tomorrow. You're sitting here making plans and vacation plans and what you're going to do with the rest of your life in your tomorrows. But you need to be focused on your todays. Amen. Yesterday's past, tomorrow is not guaranteed for you. Amen. Live your life today for Jesus Christ. Amen. It's the word. You guys are feeling some type of way. I'm sorry, y'all. I didn't Praise do it. God. I didn't say it. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. Get mad at him. You mad at somebody? Get mad at him. Yeah, him. It's not a book. It's a him. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. This is God on paper. Thank you, Lord. Don't get mad at me. Get mad at him if you're going to get mad at somebody. You'll get mad at the devil. But don't blame the devil for this one. The devil didn't say it. God said it. <laughs> it says... You don't know the least thing about what may happen tomorrow. It says, what is nature? What is the nature of your life? You are really but a wisp of vapor, a puff of smoke, a mist that is visible for a little while and then disappears into the air. Here today, gone tomorrow. Who are you? God is trying to show you how minute we are. And how grand he is. We need God. We need God. Amen. 15. You ought instead to say, if the Lord is willing, we shall live and we shall do this or that. <laughs> when you come to Jesus Christ, 
everything is if it's in the will of the Father. If it's God's will. If it's God's will. If it's God's will. I'm going to plan a vacation and go to this place if the Lord wills it. I'm going to strategize a plan to save amount, this certain amount of money every month until I have a down payment to purchase a home and live in this location for the rest of my life if the Lord wills it. He wants to be included in your decision making. He wants to be included in the details of your life. Why? Because in Christ, your life is not your own. It's his. Amen. You made that decision. That's what you signed up for. Stop making decisions for yourself, my man. For what? For what? You're going to fall flat on your face or you're going to run into a wall if you're making decisions for yourself and you call yourself a Christian. Why? Because Christianity is not about you. It's all about him. It's the word. It's the word. I want to apologize, but I can't because he's not sorry. <laughs> He wrote it. He's not sorry. <laughs> it says 16. But as it is, you boast falsely in your presumption and your self-conceit. Conceited. All such boasting is wrong. Humble yourself. Stop bragging about yourself. Stop putting yourself on a pedestal. Stop talking about what you do and how hard you work and how good you're at this. And how, Listen, all good gifts come from the Father. Amen. All glory belongs to God. Anything you do is because he allows it, is because he gave you the ability, is because he gave you the strength. It all belongs to God. Last verse, 17, it says, So any person who knows what is right to do but does not do it, to him it is sin. Get that in your spirit, man. If you know what is right and you know what is wrong and you choose to do wrong over right, that's called sin. You are out of order. You need to repent. You need to make your wrongs right with Jesus. Listen, there's repentance that goes on in my life on a regular basis. Why? Because sometimes some church folk be acting stank. Some church folk be acting a fool. Some church, and, 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 and the old Jason want to rise up real quick. Like, yo, I feel like popping them in the mouth and rebuking them in the name of Jesus and even in the name of Jason. Mm. And then I got to repent. I got to repent. Like, God, I'm sorry. It's not about me. Teach me how to love this brother to life without killing him. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> Praise God in the house. Praise God in the house. Listen, bottom line, and I'm wrapping up. We got four minutes. It's a Christ walk, not a you walk. That's what James is trying to say. He's trying to say this is a Christ walk, not a you walk. Get it in your spirit. This is a Christ walk, not a you walk. This is a Christ walk, not a you walk. Amen. This is a Christ walk, not a you walk. I'm going to say it a couple more times. Get it in your spirit. It's not about you. Amen. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's about him. So if you're going to talk about somebody, talk about him. Talk about him. It'll change your life. It will also change the life of somebody else. It'll turn a Muslim into a Christian. Amen. Come on, somebody. That's tonight's Bible study. God bless you.